My video about the technology of 3D printed antenna lenses was aimed squarely at a tiny audience of specialist RF engineers. Unbelievably, almost a million other folks like you watched it too. I was humbled and amazed, so I've made this new video for you and everyone else who isn't a pro head RF tech wizard to explain how the new generation of 3D printed antenna components work and why they often look like this. I'm not going to try to dumb it down, but I'll try really hard to avoid unnecessary crypto encabulator style jargon. Full disclosure, this video isn't sponsored, but Rogers Corporation funded the original project and the first video in this series. As you'll be aware, 3D printing makes it simple to create structures that are fiendishly hard to make using traditional machining or casting. If there are inaccessible internal spaces in a part, in the past, the only solution was to machine thin layers and somehow bond them together. But why do we need such complex parts for making the next generation of radio antenna systems in the first place? Traditional antennas are efficient and easy to manufacture, but when you want to tailor the coverage pattern of the antennas or make systems that have novel focusing methods, having complete control over the characteristics of the materials is a huge step forwards. Shortening the development process by using 3D printing means we can make materials and metamaterials that perform excellently at microwave radio frequencies. It's opened up a whole new world of applications for production as well as prototypes. The structures I want to tell you about bend and focus microwave radio energy in a similar way to how light beams can be manipulated using lenses. You've probably seen how light bends when it goes through a boundary between air and water. You might have used a magnifying glass or wear spectacles or contact lenses to help you see more clearly. Those all work because light appears to take longer to pass through most transparent materials than it does in air. Wait, what? I'm sure you've heard lots of science tubers say that the speed of light's constant. Well, yeah, it is constant, but in most transparent materials, light really does appear to take longer to travel through them than you'd expect. I could try to simplify what really happens and tell you that light does travel more slowly in glass or water, but I prefer my storytelling to be as close to reality as possible, so buckle up and hold tight. You might already know that light's an electromagnetic wave, just like X-rays, infrared, ultraviolet, and most interesting to us, radio waves. Radio waves are the same thing as light, just with a much longer wavelength. The lenses and other parts I'll be talking about today are designed to work at radio wavelengths of 6 to 12 millimetres, or between a quarter and a half inch. That's about 10,000 times longer than visible light, 1,000 times longer than infrared, and around a billion times longer than X-rays. But other than that, they're all the same thing, just at different scales. Perhaps you've heard of gamma rays? Well, they're also the same, but shorter still. Now, because radio waves and light are the same thing, the effects when a radio wave crosses a boundary from one material to another are similar to what happens with light. The rays can bend. Weirdly though, radio waves can pass through some materials that are opaque to light in the same way that x-rays can go through your suitcase at the airport. The amount of bending when light goes across a liquid air boundary to an angle depends on the properties of the liquid and the angle of the incoming beam. Same as when the beam goes into a clear solid material like glass or acrylic. The key properties are how much the beam's bent and how opaque or absorbent the material is. There's even a nice formula to work out how much the beam gets bent. Quite why it's called Snell's Law when it was discovered by Ibn Sal in 984 AD is a bit of a mystery. Those of us who are unable to read medieval Persian will probably be amused to know that the lad was trying to study how to start fires with mirrors and lenses. Several other folks like Alhazen and Harriet rediscovered the law over the centuries but failed to publish. Willibrod Snellius also failed to publish but perhaps his agent was better at marketing. Descartes had a go at it and so did Pierre de Fermat. Huygens and just about every other famous scientist seems to have added their two cents worth about lenses and refraction too. We're going to need a bit of shorthand to save time. The amount of bendiness is usually called the refractive index. A real radio frequency engineer would call it DK. But you're just an imaginary type of radio engineer, aren't you? Yeah, I'm getting a bit of a complex about it, Amy. Anyway, I'm going to call it index to keep it accessible to everyone. Those of you who know a bit of physics might know DK as relative permittivity or even epsilon r and would probably point out that DK is actually the square of the refractive index, but that's just a convenience to simplify the arithmetic for radio engineers and scientists who aren't mathematicians. 
The index is just a value that says how bendy the material appears to a wave. The measure of how opaque a material is can be called all sorts of things, but I'm going to call it loss to avoid unnecessary and disturbing jargon. Some folks call it DF, or the full name dissipation factor, or more often the loss tangent, or delta. Loss is a pretty good word. So, for our purposes in this video, index is the material's bendiness, and loss is how opaque it is. Those values for typical materials vary a lot with the late wavelength of the light or radio waves. Again, to save time, I'll use waves to mean light beams, or radio signals, or x-rays, or whatever. That's because they're all electromagnetic waves. I might mention microwaves, but this isn't a cooking channel, so it's just shorthand for waves between 1 and 10 centimetres wavelength, about 0.4 to 4 inches. Millimetre waves are from a centimetre down to a millimetre, but there's no hard and fast rules. Dry air has an index very close to 1 and 0 loss for visible light, which is great because sunlight can get through the atmosphere in the middle of a clear day to make plants grow. Glass has an index that's rather higher than air, around 1.4 for visible light. The loss is pretty damn small, but not quite zero. That means you can see through a window, but if it's very thick, you do lose some of the light passing through it. The interesting effect for us is that light appears to travel more slowly through glass or water than it does through air. In a transparent material, it seems to slow down by exactly the same amount as the refractive index. For now, let's just accept that and see how we can use it. I'll look at why the waves apparently slow down later. A magnifying glass for light is usually made from a clear plastic or glass disc with two curved faces. When a narrow light beam travelling through the air parallel to the axis of the lens hits the curved surfaces, the beam's bent a bit, just like when it goes into water at an angle. It carries on through the lens in a straight line until it hits the back surface, where the slope's steeper, and it's bent again. Then it carries on through the air and crosses the axis of the lens at a point which you probably know is called the focus. If you put a magnifying glass in front of a piece of paper in bright sunshine, the rays from the sun are almost parallel, so they all focus down to a point, and most of the power of the sunlight hitting the lens gets concentrated into a small spot at the focus that can be quite hot enough to set fire to the paper, as I found out very often as a child. Fun fact, focus is the Latin word for a hearth or fireplace. Now, because light and radio waves really are the same thing, a very distant microwave radio signal also appears as parallel rays. And if we can make a lens from material that's transparent to radio waves, like Teflon or polythene, it'll focus the power of the radio waves onto a small spot. However, a lens needs to be at least 10 times the wavelength of the radio waves, preferably much larger, or it won't be able to focus very sharply. A 13 wavelength diameter optical lens would only be 6 micrometres across, a tenth of the diameter of an average human hair. And that'd be a pretty poor lens, so our radio lenses aren't going to be high quality by any means. Right then, if we make a lens from a suitable material, we should be able to gather radio waves hitting the face of the lens and concentrate them down to a radio receiver. Or, if we have a radio transmitter at the focus, we should be able to form that into a fairly narrow beam, so the signal received at a distant site stronger, just like a flashlight fitted with a lens or a searchlight. We aren't adding any extra power, we're just sending more of the energy in the direction we want. You might have heard this property of an antenna being called gain. I prefer directivity. The whole point of these printed microwave lenses is to make an antenna with good directivity. Lots of directive antennas have rather messy coverage patterns, so they can hear unwanted signals that are off to the side rather than just straight ahead. Car head knot lights are a bit like that. When they're on full beam, they send out a bit of light sideways up and down. Useful in a car, but not in an antenna system. Warm things like trees, houses, mountains and soils give out a fair amount of thermal energy in the microwave region. And a sensitive receiver like the ones I use can hear that as noise, which masks the signals I want to hear. This is the radio noise I get from a tree in my garden as I sweep my microwave antenna across it. I might be pointing my antenna at a satellite or looking for passive reflections of microwave signals from the Moon, the International Space Station, or a distant aircraft, but if the antenna can receive some of the other directions as well as the main beam, it might pick up noise from my cabbage patch, the neighbour's house wall, or one of my huge trees. Optimising and tailing the coverage pattern of an antenna is one of the major benefits of 3D printing that's really hard to achieve in other ways. Machining a microwave from a solid block is very wasteful of material. 
It, injection moulding is feasible for some types of lens material, but making suitable moulds is ludicrously expensive. It's certainly possible to use a 3D printer to make a solid lens, but here's where we can step up to a whole new level of possibilities. 3D print technology lets you make much more complex lensing structures that can manipulate radio waves in ways that solid lenses simply can't. The classic example of a lens that's really hard to make using traditional machining is the Lunaberg. It's got the remarkable property of being able to focus waves coming from distant sources to a point on the surface of the lens and vice versa. That means you can put a transmitter at the surface of the ball and it'll be focused in a narrow beam out of the other side of the ball. Then you can add other transmitters, perhaps on different frequencies, and they'll be focused into narrow beams from the opposite side to where they're located, all at the same time. Another remarkable characteristic is that if you coat half of the ball with a reflective metal, any distant radio signal will be reflected straight back in the direction it came from. That's similar to how high-vis jackets and vehicle registration plates work. Great if you're flying a stealth fighter which is almost invisible on radar into friendly airspace and you want to appear on the air traffic controller's radar screens. I wanted to experiment with a structure that behaves rather like a focusing lens for 24 GHz radio waves with a wavelength of 12 mm, just less than half an inch. I wanted the lens to be stiff and strong without any thin edges that could get chipped or crushed. There's a clever design based on work by A.L. McCallion in 1951 which works on the same self-focusing principle as modern optical fibres on which the entire internet depends. The McCallion lens is a simple round disc made in such a way that the index varies across the disc, with higher values in the centre. There's a very simple formula for the required index value across the face of the lens. The result of that formula makes the lens behave just like a magnifying glass, but instead of the lens being thinner towards the edges, the material is printed as a sort of foam structure that's denser towards the middle of the disc. Unlike a solid lens, any ray paths other than those going right through the centre actually curve a little as they go through the lens, but the formula takes that into account. From the outside, the effect's almost identical to a solid lens with the same focal length. Time for a little more jargon. Because there's a varying density of material across the lens, it's called a gradient index lens, and often they call it a grin. I'll stick to lens, or call it a gradient index lens, if that helps the story. Back in early 2022, I made a short jokey video asking Rogers Corporation if I could have a sample of their new Radix 3D printable material to test. They explained patiently that their lovely purple jollop needed a rather clever printer, but then maybe one of those offers you don't refuse. If I created some designs, they'd print them for me on Fortify's excellent industrial printers. There was of course a catch, I had to collect the lenses in person in the USA and make a video about the experience. They'd fly me over, sort out hotels and sponsor the video. Amazing! The project included a Macadian lens I designed. It's 160mm diameter and 30mm thick. It's about 6 inches by an inch and a quarter and looks absolutely stunning in real life. So. How do you design a Michaelian lens? Well, it's really quite simple. However, if you're scarred by memories of school trigonometry lessons, look away now and hum loudly to drown out what I'm about to say. The refractive index at radius r is proportional to the hyperbolic cosecant of r times a constant that depends on the material and the thickness of the lens. OK, you can look back now and stop humming. Some folks can't hear or see you because they're still looking away and humming loudly. That wasn't a good move. All I had to do was tell the fine folks at Fortify what the equation was and they could do the rest. Sadly, I'm an idiot and didn't ask if that was possible, so ended up calculating all the values for 10 different rings of material and including those in the CAD model. The outcome was the same though because of science. If you've had dental work done in the past 20 years, you may have had a filling made from a white paste that solidifies rapidly when the dental surgeon pokes an ultraviolet torch into your mouth and lights you up all purple. The radix material made by Rogers Corporation is a liquid UV setting resin with particles of high refractive index ceramic mixed in. The resulting silky slurries pump through a tank with a transparent bottom and a build plate's pushed down to leave a tiny gap above the clear bottom of the tank. Fortify's splendid printers have a system rather like the screen on a laptop that allows bright ultraviolet light through the bottom of the lens onto the areas where you want solid material. The resin sets in that pattern, then the plate's lifted up so the soupy material sloshes back into the gap and then the plate's pushed down again so it leaves another tiny gap between the solidified bits and the bottom of the plate. 
The next layer is then exposed and sets, and the process continues for thousands of layers. It adds a new UV light pattern every time to build a new layer. You can only grow sideways a little at a time, and you can't have any overhanging bits without supports, as they wouldn't have something to stick to. But apart from that, the process is very straightforward. The machines have a lot of slick features like a wiper to clear any excess material now and then, and filters, pumps, agitators and heaters to keep the raw radix material in tip-top condition. Right gentlefolk, we can start building, we have the technology. We need some sort of structure that has smooth, gentle curves, no isolated elements and that can be generated easily with a variable density. Something like a sponge perhaps. There are various structures that'll work, but one of the best based on another simple formula. Not only does it create a stiff structure with no lines of weakness, but it's guaranteed to be completely free of closed internal voids and has no isolated bits or peaks that would be disconnected from the rest of the print. Even better, it's based on a unit cell that's a cube and the formula can generate a structure many unit cells wide, deep and high. You can vary the thickness of the wall of the unit cells smoothly, so the effective density of the material varies in any directions you choose. You can also define the boundary of the structure with another formula to make a cube, plate, disc, cone, sphere, hemisphere or just about any other shape. We aren't limited to geometric shapes of course, so if I wanted a chihuahua shaped lens I could certainly have one made. The structure that Fortify and Rogers used to make my Michaelian lens design rejoices in the name gyroid lattice, but that's just mathematical jargon designed to alarm and exclude non-mathematicians. A useful thing about the gyroid structure not having any closed voids is that we can wash out any incurred resin very easily, and UV light can get inside to ensure the resin's fully hardened. Also, any remaining washing fluids can be baked out in an oven without danger of cracking the material as trap vapour boils off. Generating a gyroid is very simple unless you're allergic to high school trigonometry, in which case you might want to avert your gaze and hum for a minute or so again. Or you could be brave and watch, it's only words and symbols, not at all scary, and the results are often quite stunningly gorgeous. Mathematicians would tell you that a gyroid's a triply periodic minimal surface, but they might as well call it a gyroencabulator for all the meaning that name conveys yet more complicated jargon that we simply don't need to use. I'm going to call it a gyroid, mostly because it's such a cool name. I wrote a little program to generate a single unit cell with a specified wall thickness. It calculates a grid of points where the formula gives the correct answer, and then fills in the areas between the dots with tiny triangles, and stitches all the triangles together to make two surfaces just the right distance apart. Finally, it fills the volume between the two surfaces to make a solid shape. The formula wouldn't be out of place in high school class, so let's continue to be brave unless it's all too much, in which case the outcome will be along very shortly. The formula has three parts, x, y and z are the distances left, right, back, forward and up, down. Each part's a sine times a cosine. The first part's sine x cos y, the next is sine y cos z, and the last is sine z cos x, sort of goes in a circle. All the program does is find where in 3D space the expression gives the right thickness. For those who are interested in the program, I use MATLAB code running under GNU Octave with a plugin to generate an STL file. I've got zero interest in program. I've been doing it since 1972 and it's very, very boring. But I know there are folks out there who find it fascinating for some unfathomable reason. After the program crunches the numbers, the STL file looks like this. Remember, this is just one unit cell, but Individual cells all fit together seamlessly in three dimensions, as long as any variation in the wall thickness is gradual and smooth. Random factoid for any lepidopterists in the room. The iridescence of a butterfly's wing is caused by the presence of self-organising membranes that form gyroid photonic crystals. Cool name and butterflies. Way to go. If you're enjoying this content, please consider clicking the like button and maybe even subscribing. If you're feeling generous and really want to make a difference to the channel, I now have a Patreon and buy me a coffee for donations to help me make more content. Patrons on the higher tiers also get access to my private Discord and everyone who supports the channel financially receives a newsletter every couple of weeks. As I said at the start of the video, it's not sponsored, but the project was made possible by the excellent folks at Rogers Corporation and Fortify. All the details are in the description and there are links up there. 
If you're interested in talking to Rogers about a commercial application of Radix or Fortify about potential additive machining applications, please use the link or at least mention the channel when you make contact. I generated a much larger gyroid design using MS Lattice, including a variable wall thickness from top to bottom. Rather than just viewing it in ParaView, I imported the STL file into Fusion 360 and made some corrections to smooth out the lattice a little, and then rendered the resulting object. I've left a link in the description if you want to try MS Lattice. So, how do we get a particular index value from a wall thickness? If the unit cells are small relative to a wavelength in the material, the effective index is just that of the solid resin multiplied by the ratio of the air to resin. Mathematicians would probably call that the fill fraction, but we won't. We can set the required thickness by adjusting the wall thickness expression in the formula and adjust the index value so it can vary in any way we like. So, with a nice simple formula to generate any arrangement of variable index values in a stiff and strong structure that's simple to print. What's not to like? About half the class now have their hands raised asking if they can print gyroid lattices on their home printers. Well, it's a nice simple job unless you want usable RF performance. Folks with UV resin printers are rather stuck as there aren't yet any resins that are low loss and affordable and that can be printed on a hobby class printer. Those of you with filament printers do have a few options for RF capable filaments like Preperm and Zetamix. I'll be making a video later this year trying to use some of the new filaments to print working lenses on some hobbyist filament printers like my Prusa. So watch this space. Now earlier on I made a rather bold statement that the bending of rays was caused by waves appearing to travel more slowly in materials with a higher index value. The material the lens is made from is usually referred to as a dielectric. When a wave passes through a good dielectric, the electric part of the wave puts stress on the charges of the molecules, atoms and electrons in the material. A bit like when you rub a balloon on a cat. Some solid dielectric materials like PVC, PVA, ABS and PETG have a lopsided distribution of electronic charge on their molecules. Physicists would call them polar, but lopsided's fine by me. Polar dielectrics like those plus plexiglass, nylon and polycarbonate are usually a bit rubbish at microwave frequencies with relatively high loss. Some of them, like nylon, absorb a lot of water as well, which makes the loss even worse for microwaves. RF engineers prefer the dielectrics to have molecules that are nice and symmetrical like Teflon, polythene, polystyrene, some ceramics and synthetic precious stones like sapphire. In good microwave materials, without any lopsidedness, the main effect of electric field changes is stretching and compressing the distances between atoms in the material, twisting the atoms around an axis, or pushing the electron clouds around atoms away from the nucleus of those atoms. As with anything that involves things with mass and some springy force between them, there are resonances at certain frequencies. Loss gets much worse as the waves approach the resonances. Good microwave dielectrics have their resonances well into the terahertz band with wavelengths of a fraction of a millimetre, so the materials perform really well throughout the microwave and millimetre wave ranges with losses hundreds of times lower than the polar materials, which often have resonances down in the microwave or millimetre wave regions anyway. If you use Teflon or PTFE, the molecules are long chains of carbon atoms, each with a pair of fluorine atoms attached. The carbon chains crinkled a bit, so there's a tiny amount of lopsidedness at each carbon atom, but it's balanced out by the opposing effect of the next carbon in the chain. The fluorines can turn a little bit about the axis of the molecule, so there's a resonance around 1.5 terahertz, and the bond between each carbon atom and its associated fluorines can vibrate lengthwise, either individually or as pairs, with several resonances around about 6 terahertz in the far infrared. An electric field from our microwave signal pulls the atoms around a bit and causes opposing tiny fields from each of the imbalances with a very short but important delay. If the electric field from your applied microwave signals change in direction 24 billion times a second, so is the lopsidedness of all those bonds and to a smaller extent the electron clouds in their atoms. They all generate their own tiny, slightly delayed electric field which radiates and of course that field also affects all of the other bonds and electron clouds in the material. Worse still, every one of those little sources affects all the other imbalances which all then affect each other. That level of complexity is why we invented physics professors.
All that happens with microwaves is that the little delayed fields from all those jiggling bonds and electron clouds combine with what's left of the original wave to make a new wave that seems like it's travelling more slowly while it was passing through the dielectric. All the waves within the material have definitely travelled at the speed of light, but when they combine together, the effect of all the different phases is just the same as if the wave had travelled more slowly through the material. By fair means or foul, our microwave signals delayed a little as it passes through the material of the printed lens and as a result it can focus the microwave just like with a magnifying glass or burning glass for light. And we can tailor how the lens affects the waves with almost complete freedom to innovate. If you wanted to make the microwave beam diverge or bend or fan out sideways or reflect off a plate to illuminate a dish antenna, you can do an initial design using optical workbench software run some open EMS or HFSS simulations, tweak the shape and the gradient index settings and then print the lens and test it. If it needs further improvement, you can adjust the model and print a new test lens, saving a huge amount of time in the development cycle and allowing much more experimentation and creativity. You can even try out what seem to be completely outlandish designs with relatively low investment in time and materials, so long as you have the access to the right material and the right printer. Right now, that level of capability is still rather in the realm of commercial, academic and military users rather than folks like me and you. But the technology and services are developing rapidly. Truly, we live in interesting times, my friends. I'll be trying out some new 3D printable dielectric filaments in the next few months to see if that technology is mature enough to work well with hobby class filament printers like my Prusa. The next step for this current project is making the lens mounts and housings, designing and machining the feed horns and transitions, and doing comparisons with my traditional antennas using some kit that my lovely Patreon supporters have helped me purchase. That'll be in the next video in this series, which will be in the playlist up there.